Hi, my name is Dr. Emma Guru. Welcome to this talk on sex education and autistic LGBTQIA plus young people. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm an autistic adult and I write and research and teach and have a life coaching consultancy, um, mainly for autistic adults and young people. Sex education is often done in schools, but schools don't actually cover the myriad of hidden curriculum aspects to dating and sexual relationships. So they're very much just about um, this is what the act of sex is, usually just for heterosexual um, cisgendered couples. So children and young people um, will get information from friends, the media, popular culture, but this can be not only inaccurate but have disastrous consequences. So, for example, um, if you're watching TV or movies that appear to suggest that dinner is a fair exchange for sex, um, then you might go out for dinner with friends and feel like you have to have sex with them. You may not understand that explicit consent is necessary for sex, as TVs and movies don't actually um, portray this. And popular culture seems to imply that hookups, so that sex without any form of ongoing commitment, are the norm and that everybody's doing this. And they're not really, um, and everybody is not really doing this. A sex education can be formally delivered at school, it can be informally done by parents and friends through discussions, it can be discovered online or in books. The difficulty is that when young people don't have access to accurate or enough information, it makes them more vulnerable to exploitation, abuse, sexually transmitted diseases and figurative heartbreak. Unfortunately, this is particularly true for autistics who may interpret poor quality information literally. Um, they may believe people when they say, if you have sex with me, um, I love you. Um, if you do this particular thing that you don't necessarily want to do, then it means that um, you're just like everybody else. And teenage autistics can have wildly inaccurate or no information at all and so may struggle to understand healthy relationships, let alone healthy intimacy. When we're thinking about what sex education needs to cover in general, the three main areas are healthy relationships, sexual intimacy, and sexual health. And most states and territories are getting better at these three areas. Um, and the Student Wellbeing Hub certainly covers um, healthy relationships and sexual intimacy for um, autistics. So have you gone to the Student Wellbeing Hub? Um, you can search autism and relationships and there's a curriculum there for um, young people. Now, is this enough for autistics and other neurodivergent young people? Well, possibly not. So one of the things about being autistic is, well, how do we actually know what our gender is just because somebody has labelled as a gender? How do we know whether that gender fits us or not? Um, how do we know if we're sexually attracted to someone? And once we are deciding whether or not we're going to be having sex, how do we know if the sensory and emotional aspects of sex will be okay or not in the way that we experience them, if they'll cause us distress or not? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about interoceptive awareness here. So interoceptive awareness is your conscious perception of your internal body signals. Um, so things like when you're full or hungry, um, when you're thirsty, when you need to go to the toilet, um, but there are also other kinds of internal body signals such as your hormones. Now, our hormones become more active in puberty and our hormones are often what signal to us whether we're in love or in lust with somebody. And possibly what the difference between the two is, um, from an internal perspective, I'm not quite sure on that. So I don't have particularly good interoceptive awareness of my hormone. The reason that interoception is important is that we need a set of interoception skills to understand ourselves and self-regulate. And understanding ourselves is important in the context of um, sexuality, gender, identity, and relationships. So there are three parts to this understanding ourselves. There's the first is awareness of your internal body states. So you might be aware that um, your heart is thumping and you've got sweaty palms and your throat is tight and your body's shaking. Um, now, in themselves, those are useful, but it then becomes more useful when you're aware of how all these body signals fit together to give you your feelings and emotions. 
So it might be that you're actually feeling a bit anxious through those emotions, um, through that those feelings we just talked about. Now, when you have those two things, you also need an awareness of the impact of external things on you. So, for example, um, if you're feeling anxious, and you know that because of these things, but you're not sure what it is in the environment that's making you feel anxious, it can be quite hard to respond to your environment in an appropriate way. And if we take this in the context of um, gender identity, uh, sexuality, and so on, if you are not aware of the hormonal body signals and you're not aware of the feelings and emotions that these are causing or signaling, you won't be able to respond to them. And for example, if you're not aware if somebody else um, giving you signals of interest or giving you signals of not being interested, you won't be able to respond to those signals. So we really need both the internal and the external. Now, most autistics have a typical interoception, and this can lead to atypical presentations of the self. And unfortunately, many of these can lead to some things that are a little bit problematic for us. Um, misunderstandings and communication difficulties can come out of this, a lack of sense of belonging or a sense of alienation, feeling less than, um, frustration, difficulties knowing who you're attracted to, difficulties managing managing other people's emotions so it's not just the impact on you about managing your own emotions um, if we're not aware of how that emotion feels in us it's hard to know how we should be managing that in somebody else and an example of this is um, I was talking with a young person doing some coaching and mentoring and I asked how they knew if somebody was starting to get sad and then what you would do in this instance so um, she said that, you know, people are starting to get sad and that water stuff runs down their face and you, you give them a tissue, that's what you do so they can catch the water stuff. And it's interesting because tears are usually not the beginning of feeling sad. Tears um, are really when somebody is really quite sad. And so because she didn't understand what it was when she was feeling sad she wasn't in touch with those feelings she didn't really know how to respond to other people being sad she was very practical and very kind and she could sense that something wasn't right but she didn't know how to respond to it and of course these can all cause problems in relationships and if we take that how do I know how I feel in terms of um, gender identity and sexuality you know, how do you know who you're attracted to? How do you know if you're experiencing sexual desire? Um, how do you know if you're experiencing love or lust? And also, if you're in a situation, how do you know that you're experiencing sensory distress? And this is really important for those people who don't know it, that they're distressed until they're extremely distressed. And if you're one of those people and you're a young person thinking about exploring sex, you will probably be thinking, well, is this going to make sex a problem? What if I'm doing something and I get hurt and I don't actually notice I'm hurt until I'm really hurt? What if I don't like something about sex and I don't notice it until, you know, we're really into it and then it's really problematic when I try and express that? These two lovely um, quotes are from Demi Moore and Quentin Crisp, so they're two very different people. And Demi is talking about feeling sexy when she feels loved and that sexy is feeling good from the inside and you want to naturally open up and give and she thinks that comes from being able to receive love and desire. So that's a really interesting quote and it may be very difficult on a practical sense for somebody with atypical interoception to get those sensations, those feelings. Now, Quentin Crisp is talking about, well, I have very little to say in favour of sex. It's vastly overrated, frequently unnecessary, and it's messy. But it's greatly to be preferred to the interminable torments of romantic agony through which two people tear one another limb from limb whilst professing, professing altruistic devotion. So talking about the difference between love and lust, um, and very much um, suggesting that the, the act of sex itself um, is not that great. 
So you can see how these, these two attitudes are completely different, which brings us to this idea of complicated personalities or complex personalities. Then we think about autistics, what brings great joy to an autistic adult or a teen can often be perceived of as childish or childlike by other people. And this can make it really hard for other people to see us as teens or adults who have teen, young person or adult interests as well. In addition, we tend to have a complex mix of strengths and support needs or struggles. And this can make navigating social relationships hard as other people may not be used to that complex mix of strengths and support needs. Now, we then add in sex, when sex can have a highly complex um, set of social negotiations that take place before it happens, or it can be as simple as a swipe left, right, on Tinder or Grinder, saying yes, no, want it, don't want it, or another date, type of dating app. And then there are the sensory and emotional elements of sex, and these can make it both wonderful and horrific, or both at the same time for some people. So it's really important that um, we as autistics have a set of knowledge to help us navigate that as well as the people around us um, having knowledge about how we might be negotiating these things. So one of the things that autistics really need to know is that it's okay to express our gender in the way that feels right to us and that may be fixed or fluid. Now I'm just going to add a caveat here. If you are in um, a family or environment where it is not safe to express your gender in a way that feels right to you, it's important that you stay safe first um, and that you seek assistance to find some ways of being yourself in ways that are, are safe for you. Um, this links in with the that some people can react negatively towards people for a range of reasons, so we need to know how to stay safe. Autistics need to know that it's okay to be sexually attracted to another consenting adult of any gender, um, that it's okay to be asexual, but not attracted to people, but that if you are attracted to a consenting adult um, of any gender, that if they are not interested, that you know how to stay safe in case they react negatively towards you. I think the final thing on this slide that's, that's really struck me over the years is really important and something that hasn't I think ever been taught to me was that sex is different with different people. Different personalities together, different sensory things, they all impact how sex is experienced. So if I have sex with two different people at two different times, the likelihood is that that sex experience will be very different for me and for them than it is for me with the other person. And this is important because if you have an unpleasant sexual experience, in your early years of exploring, you may feel that all sexual experiences will be awful. And that really shouldn't be the case. We really do need sex education before we experiment, not afterwards. Um, education is what keeps us safe. And this includes really practical things like how do you put a condom on a penis? Um, when I was at school, we were given bananas and condoms. Did you put condoms on bananas? Um, yes, that did teach us the right way out to put it on. Um, but bananas and, and penises are not the same shape, size, colour, texture. So it's really not a transferable skill. And I'm not suggesting that we practice on real penises unless you are somebody who has your own penis, in which case absolutely practice putting it on your own penis. Um, but perhaps practicing on a more lifelike um, representation of a penis, such as a dildo or vibrator that um, more easily teaches you the transferable skill. The other thing we really need sex education on before we start experimenting with after is sexual health, um, how to actual access sexual health checkups in a safe environment and contraception if that is going to be necessary. At the most basic, everybody should know the age of consent in their own state or territory or state or territory they're visiting. 
And one of the biggest reasons for this is that sexting underage is a criminal offence and the offence is child pornography. So if you send a friend a picture of yourself naked and one or both of you is under the age of consent, you have both committed child pornography offences. And that's something that um, is really big impact on the rest of your life. So it's really important to understand the legal aspects of sex too. Now, when we think about gender, um, when I was, I don't know, probably eight or nine, um, I remember learning about the difference between a male body and a female body. So one had a, a penis and one had a vagina. But gender identity is not always fixed. It's not always um, experienced as binary either, and it doesn't necessarily match up to a person's genitals. So if somebody um, is born intersex, they used to be assigned a binary gender, so they were, their parents were instructed to bring them up as either a boy or a girl. Even though they were born neither a boy nor a girl, they were a, a combination of different um, sex characteristics from both. So gender is a social construct and in countries like um, Australia, in the colonizers' cultures, the social contract was very clear that there was a male and a female. Now, in other cultures, this spectrum is wider and for example gender includes things like being two-spirited so in first nations people of north america there are two-spirited people and these individuals are understood by everybody within their culture to have characteristics that encompass both male and female identities the social constructs of gender include things like um, what men do what women do and one of the things that interests me about this is the um, male brain theory that's uh, associated with autism. And, I mean, what is a male brain? Um, if autistics have a more male brain than typical people, what does that mean in terms of female autistics? It's very odd. And then do genitals really have the power to define who we are and what our roles in society are? Now, in some cultures the roles are very rigid and very fixed, whereas in others, such as Australia, they are much less fixed and much more flexible. And what if it is those gender roles that are the issue and you don't have body dysmorphia, but you do have a problem with gender roles? Can you just do what you want or do you need to change your gender identity? These are really important issues to discuss. And social constructs do change with time. So in previous eras, really not that long ago, probably only 40, 50 years ago, single mothers were very stigmatised, whereas now it's the norm and it's not problematic. Women wearing trousers was um, abhorred and it was even illegal uh, initially, and it's now the norm. Men wearing dresses, a kilt's fine in Scotland, but why not a paisley dress? Um, it's really interesting there are cultures where there are skirt or dress type um, clothing for men, but if they wear something very different that is seen as feminine, that's sometimes a problem. Now, jobs, housework, parenting, etc., etc., all of these have gender roles in different cultures, but they're not universal or permanent. So in some cultures, gathering the food is seen as a male. Um, job, whereas in other cultures it's a female job and in others it's not gendered at all. And it's really important to understand that these do change over time as well. So there is a much greater gender diversity in autism than there is in the non-autistic population. And part of this I think is really, and there is research recently that came out this year that um, found this too, that autistics don't see or accept social constructs, um, including from the hidden curriculum. 
So we often just express ourselves as ourselves. We are us, truer than true. We're just being who we are. And if this doesn't hurt anyone, then it really isn't a problem. And it's really important to support your children, friends, family members, partners who are autistic, who are expressing their gender in ways that are not traditional or typical. Accept them for who they are and use the language that they request. Really important if somebody wishes to have particular pronouns or um, be called by a particular name, use that language. It's respectful and it's validating. Many autistics can dislike traditional gender roles. There are some that like traditional gender roles from their culture, but many don't. We can also struggle over time to work out who we are or to be really sure about who we are, and we can find it hard to communicate that. Um, when Lawson has, has been very open about their struggle to work out who they really were, and then to express their identity authentically and how many years that took. And that this, they felt, he felt that was due to being autistic, that it took him so long to be so confident about who he was. Part of that, I think, is that other people sometimes think they can impose their values on us and they do impose their values on us and sometimes we buy into that. And it can take a while to unlearn that. Now, cis females and males can be stereotyped um, quite quickly, quite frequently. One of the difficulties in that is that autistic women can be at more risk of family violence than um, other groups of women. Trans women are extremely at risk of family violence and, and public violence too. So if you're autistic and trans, this is a really big issue. Many of us on spectrum struggle to be seen as good partners and potential parents by other people, even though many of us are. So when you meet somebody and you say to them, I'm autistic, they may have no idea what that means. Now, even though gender stereotypes and autism are really not true, um, so by that I mean that the male presentation of autism and the female presentation of autism, these these don't hold true for everybody. What's interesting about these ideas of a male presentation of autism and a female presentation of autism is that many trans autistics present their autism in their gender and not their birth gender. Um, I've met a number of trans autistics personally and been through um, their diagnosis journey with them and part of the difficulty for them was that they were being um, assessed as were they presenting autistic in their birth gender um, and they weren't they actually were fairly typically presenting in what we think of as typical um, presentations of autism in the gender that they identified with <coughs> Right, we're going to move on to um, a, another area now. So the, this, is, this is so interesting, the idea that young adult autistics aren't interested in sex. And now there absolutely are some adults, young adult autistics and, and older adult autistics that are not interested in sex. It is perfectly valid and valuable to be asexual. Um, and the reason this, this strikes me so much is that I presented a workshop on sexuality about 20 years ago now and a parent came up to me afterwards and said that his daughter hadn't had any sex education because she was autistic and the school had thought that she would never have sex so they had not um, had her as part of the sex ed classes. And he really wanted his daughter to have sex education, to have a sexual life um, and sex experiences and to, um, in his words, have the adult life that she wanted, whether it was with a long-term partner or with short-term partners. And yet at the same time, um, 20 years ago, I was meeting a lot of parents that were saying they didn't want their children to have adult relationships when they're adult. They didn't want their children to... Um, have children accidentally um, because they didn't have the information about contraception and there was not an understanding of the gender and sexuality 
uh, variance that is present in, in autistics. Now, for some autistics, sex is a sensory joy, and for others, it's a, a sensory struggle. All of us on the spectrum, unfortunately, are at risk of um, date rape, sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, um, and sex education will help to challenge that. I just want to talk about the difference here between celibacy, um, which is where you choose to not have sex with anybody, um, and abstinence, which is where you're waiting for the right person, and asexuality, which is an orientation. So it's not a choice. You're not sexually attracted to people. Um, you may still have sex um, or you may not. So the celibacy is where you're choosing um, not, to, not to have sex and abstinence, you're also choosing that. The sexual identity is, is a social construct in some ways because it, it, we use that social construct as a de de definition of who we are um, and who we prefer to have intimate sexual relationships with. And these are often in gendered terms. There are lots of aspects to sexual identity, not just homo, hetero, bisexual. So it, we used to just think that there were the three aspects. You either were sexually attracted to and had intimate sexual relationships with your people of your own gender so then you were homosexual, which means same sex. And if you had um, were attracted to and had sex with people of the opposite, because people thought in binary terms then, um, then you were hetero, which means different. And if you liked both and had sex with both or were attracted to both, you were bisexual. And this fluidity of attraction isn't covered in those three sociocultural um, labels above. Um, now, they all have social contracts and values attached to them. And there is more sexuality diversity proportionally within the autistic community than in the non-autistic community. And it's probably for the same reason as gender diversity. If we're with someone and we feel comfortable um, and attracted to them, we're more likely to express that than to think, oh, well, I have this label, therefore I shouldn't do that. Or people will think less of me if I do that. And there's a, a small difference between procreation and sex. So procreation is the act of attempting to have a child, have a baby, through um, heterosexual intercourse. So that is um, somebody with a penis and somebody with a vagina having um, the penis inside the vagina aiming to ha have an orgasm so that sperm is released so that hopefully our baby can be conceived. Now, sex is a con or should be a consensual activity that brings sexual pleasure to those engaging in it. And to be safe, you should be using condoms if there is a penis involved or other barriers. Both procreation and sex are messy and can be very noisy. And it's interesting because in both of those, um, no matter what the genders of people involved are, if you have people um, touching people intimately, Many non-autistic people understand when it's going from friendship to intimacy or when it's going from casual, know each other, to sexual encounter. However, these are um, quotes from autistic adults who explain that actually it's not that simple for us. So um, I didn't actually realise what was happening until I noticed I was naked. She said she was just going to tickle me. I like tickles, but it didn't seem like a tickle. And this particular person, the tickling was over their entire body, including um, breasts and including vulva and um, the lips and going into, into their vagina. He asked if he could, but I didn't actually know what he meant. And I didn't want to seem like an idiot, so I didn't ask what he meant. So the person um, who shared this with me didn't actually intend to have a sexual encounter. Um, they were quite happily kissing with the person and were very happy with that. Um, and the, the person said to them, you know, can I? And she didn't know that he was saying, can I have intimate sexual relations with you? Can I put my body parts inside your body parts? Can I touch you in ways that typically are only done if somebody is being sexually intimate with somebody? 
and she did have sex with um, a person and it was only in unpacking how that happened and all the things that he said and she said and where it went that she realised that was the point that she could have said no. We also need to understand both as young people and as adults what is the difference between an exploitative encounter and a fun one night stand? So it's okay for us just to have sex with somebody that we met as long as we're safe, they're safe. Um, what is the difference between that and somebody that we know who says, if you have sex with me, I'll be your friend? One is exploitative and one isn't. How many times can you call someone before it becomes stalking or harassment? And that goes for texts as well. What smells, noises, textures will we encounter when exploring our own bodies or other people's bodies? And this doesn't get covered in sex education and it can be uncomfortable for parents to talk about with their young people. But it's really important because if you don't know that there are going to be smells, noises and textures, you can't prepare for it. You can have um, a really strong reaction, whether that's a pleasurable reaction or an aversive reaction, including going into complete overload or shutdown. And sex should be a pleasurable activity. Intimacy should be pleasurable. And if somebody's first experiences lead to um, a shutdown or um a really aversive experience and overload, it's going to be really difficult for them to feel the confidence to enter into those states again. There's some legal issues. The age of consent is different in different places. Um, consent has been in the media a lot recently. Um, Victoria is talking about moving to a different form of consent where you actually have to say yes um, in order for there to be consent, whereas currently consent is taken as not saying no. So consent is only not given if you say no. It's always good to ask consent. So when I want to be intimate with somebody, I will say to them, would you like to have sex? Um, would you like to a particular aspect so I might pick something that I have done with them before or that I would like to do with them and in describe that in detail so it might be you know could I kiss your nipple please um and getting consent it's it's a good thing to do people aren't used to doing this and um sometimes they might say things like oh you're spoiling the mood just do it but it's important that you know you have the right to give consent and the other person has the right to give consent and you both have the right to say no as well. You cannot legally give consent if you are under the age of consent. The Organisation for Autism Research um, has a really good sex education guide for South Africans. This is really for... Uh, older teens and young adults, whereas the Student Wellbeing Hub is for um, mid-primary, uh, no, upper primary and junior high. So prior to this one, this one is for older kids. And this is really a good website um, with a lot of autistic adult input into designing it. Some of the videos on consent uh, are maybe not explicit enough for autistics, but on the whole, it's quite a good site. So I mentioned a little bit about sensory and emotional stuff. Um, sex can be highly emotional or totally transactional, whether you're in a relationship or not. So um, if I have a friend with benefits and um, that means that I have a friend that I have sexual intimacy with when we both feel like it, we might have sex on, say, Tuesday, and it'd be a really emotional um, time. And I might have sex on Thursday, and it might be totally transactional. It's just, I want an orgasm, you want an orgasm, let's go have it. And that can be the case if you're in a long-term relationship of any kind or if it's somebody you just met. Now, 
Exchanging sex for money is thought of as just transactional, but it can be highly emotional. And if you are thinking um, about working in the sex industry or you know people who work in the sex industry, it's really important you understand that it can be highly emotional at times and it is illegal in places. So you need to make sure that you know what you're doing, where you're doing it, whether it's legal and you keep yourself safe. So the sensory aspects of sex, I've tried to list all of them, but I might have missed some. So the smells of the people in their bodily fluids. Now, those bodily fluids are somewhat contained for cis men in a condom. So when they orgasm, the um, ejaculate stays in the condom, so the smell stays in the condom. However, condoms smell too. Um, in terms of vision, clothed and naked people, these can be fascinating uh, or not. They can be um, attractive or not. Tactile, so that touch, kiss, bodily contact, penetration of body parts, um, it's all highly sensory. In terms of taste, kissing, uh, oral sex, licking of body parts, all those have a taste sensation. There are so many sounds involved in not just kissing, touching, but bodily contact and penetration of body parts. Our vestibular and proprioceptive sense are also used in terms of how the people involved move apart and together so two or more people moving their bodies um, into and out of each other or around each other um, for their sexual encounter that has a sensory impact on on you and then there's the interoceptive sensory impact so the release of bodily fluids from inside to out changes heart rate breathing muscular tension um, and that's quite a lot of sensory stuff um, and you can see why then there could also be some emotional elements of the sensory aspects too. Now one of the interesting things I heard when um, I was a bit younger was that autistics can't manage complex relationships and this blew my mind because honestly all relationships are complex um, and we can make mistakes but everyone makes mistakes, not just autistics. And I think some relationships that seem complex to non-autistics seem so simple to, to some of us on the spectrum. So, the, I'm, for example, Sister Wives. So this is a, a man who is a, a Mormon. He has a TV show called Sister Wives, and these are four of his wives. Um, I think last time I watched the program, he had five. And that could be seen to be highly complex, but actually... These complex relationships have clear rules and boundaries. So all the the non-monogamous, non-one-person with one-person relationships that I've been in have been very clear and upfront about their rules and boundaries. But the the long-term monogamous relationships that I've been in have had so many hidden rules, um, hidden norms. And and I like the the, the sort of meme is he quality casual just taking things slow like how do you know in a in a simple relationship where you're at in the relationship how do you know whether you're um being seen as fun or being seen as longer term possibly family material um you know, to, to make a family with and by family i don't necessarily mean a, having children i mean just two people that two or more people that um, interact in ways that that are um, emotionally connected and supportive. Monogamous is not the same as committed. Now, monogamous um, is when you are one person with one person. Poly polyamorous, you have um, many lovers or partners. Um, you would be celibate, promiscuous, committed through to no strings attached, not literally. Um, <laughs> brief, long-term, lifelong, and committed tends to be monogamous or polyamorous and you're planning for the rest of your life. But you can also be committed for a short period of time. Um, no strings attached is an interesting one. I'm sorry I laugh. Every time I, I do a no strings attached, I think of um, people tying each other up for some um, fun. No strings attached actually means free of conditions, limitations, or obligations. So no, no strings attached um, might be I'm loaning you my car just because I like you and, I, you know, you need a car. In terms of relationships, no strings attached tend to be um, 
very explicitly this is about having a sexual encounter with you and not having emotional interactions. Sometimes friends with benefits are also referred to as no strings attached. Um, and friends with benefits is, I've already explained. So it is very complicated. Now, there are some explanations that can help. So if you think about who benefits from a friends with benefits relationship, um, which many people in a friends with benefits relationship say they're not in a relationship, it's just a friend with benefits. And what they mean is, is um, saying we're friends first and I'll have sex with you when we both feel like it. But this other quote is really interesting. Friends with benefits is another way of saying good enough to hang with, good enough to lay with, have sex with, but never good enough to be with, to stay with, to marry. Um, and it's possible that for some people it is like that and it's possible for other people that it's it's um, much more about I want to only have sex with my friends, I don't want to have sex with people I don't know very well and maybe it will change and maybe it won't. So we have this sort of triangular thing. We have love, we have sex, we have friendships. And in the intersections between those are the relationships. So the relate, it, intersection between love and sex is often a couple or throuple. Um, it's two or more people. Um, and their relationship may be incredibly fleeting. It may be just that moment or it may be ongoing. Um, if you love someone you're friends with, and that can be quite complicated. If you have sex with someone you're friends with and that's all you do with them, you don't hang out with them or anything else, sometimes people call that a fuck buddy. Um, and if you have all three, so you have sex with somebody you love and you're friends with, that's pretty much the perfect match. And it may be one or more people. And it may be short-term or long-term. In terms of relationships, relationships tend to be about truly letting someone know you. And for autistics, this can be complicated because we may not know us ourselves. Um, and in addition, many of the types of relationships valued by non-autistics are not necessarily valued by autistics and vice versa. And it's really important to understand that relationships are defined by the people in them, not the assumptions made about them by everyone else. But you all need to be clear about the relationship rules and boundaries. So um, these are, are two, two quotes. Um, his friends can't understand how I identify as a lesbian and be in a relationship with a man who is asexual. Suits me fine. So this is an autistic adult um, who is in a committed long-term relationship with a male. Um, however, she is... She identifies as lesbian, so attracted to women and has sex with women. Um, and he is asexual. He doesn't have sexual attraction at all. So what this says is that their relationship works for them and other people attach social constructs to those labels that mean it doesn't work in their heads. It's okay to use... Uh, labels in the way that suit you you don't need to buy into the entire social construct of every label there are lots of different kinds of adult relationships not all of them um, are intimate at all so acquaintances neighbors peers colleagues client service provider lecturer student friends families so your parents siblings grandparents aunts uncles children etc um, you can have non-sexual and sexual partners um, online or virtual friends purely by technology or real life face-to-face. -face. Now, some of these can intersect and it's illegal or unethical for some of them to intersect. So you can have a sexual partner in real life or online only, um, but you really can't have a sexual relationship with a service provider that you're a client for. It's unethical. It's illegal to have um, a sexual relationship with your teacher and so on and so forth. So this is a really good um, set of, of words to go through to put together in different ways to find out what, what is um, illegal, unethical, and what is not. And it helps you to know when people are approaching you whether they're being unethical or seeking out illegal activity. So in terms of those types of relationships, again, so we've gone through the range of them. Now these are the types. It's either non-sexual or sexual. And so non-sexual can be your partner, friend, colleague, boss, acquaintances, etc. 
sexual relationships tend to have labels like partners, um, friends with benefits, casual sexual relationships, one night stands. Now, these do not have to be at night. That is just generally what people say if you have um, an intimate sexual relationship with a person once. Um, an affair is usually secretive sexual relationship where one of the people is in a committed relationship with someone else. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of relationship it is. It should be respectful. And all sexual relationships sh must be consensual. Um, this cartoon is illustrating about an affair. So you like him, but he doesn't like you. He has no idea. Uh, and you are feeling something in your body, you're feeling unrequited love is the label for it. Um, he really likes you, but you don't like him in this. She's frustrated by that, but it's possible that he's feeling unrequited love too. And then you're crazy about each other and his wife isn't thrilled. And they're both like, oops, um, possibly uh, she didn't know that he was married. And possibly everybody knew and everybody was okay with it too. Now, we also need to know a lot about safety. So everyone in every relationship argues at some point, but how much arguing is okay? And is it arguing of any kind? What about if someone says they hit you because they love you? Is that okay? What if sex is painful? Is that okay? What if they or I don't want to use condoms? Is that okay? It's never okay never okay to hit someone it's never okay to be hit if they say they love you and that's why they hit you then this is a red flag that you need to end the relationship but you need to seek help to leave safely um, sex can be painful at times um, if there is some angle that is a bit wrong or if there isn't enough lubricant involved no matter what the genders um, no, what it, no matter whether they're penises or not, whether there is um, just hands touching, sometimes we can hurt our partners accidentally. Um, but if it's on purpose, that's not so good. Um, if sex is continuously painful for you, you may want to seek out um, support from your GP or a sex therapist or a gynecologist. Um, a urologist to see if there is um, a physical issue or if there is um, some underlying um, issues that you might benefit from psychology for. Now, if you want to conceive a baby, um, you shouldn't use condoms with that person that you're wanting to conceive the baby with, but you should have a sexual health checkup first. Um, in all other instances, unless you are in a committed relationship, not having sex with other people, you need to practice safe sex because of the risk of sexually transmitted diseases. And domestic violence can happen to anybody. It can happen with any kind of relationship between any kind of people. Um, doesn't matter what your gender or sexuality is. Women can um, hurt other people. Men can hurt other people, non-binary people can hurt other people, and so on and so forth. And we are all at risk. It's about power and control. And in a good relationship, there's a balance of power. And a relationship has reciprocity. So it's, it's a balance between a place of shelter and a space of freedom, leaving a meaningful daily life. Where there is um, violence, it can be either physical, sexual, emotional, economic, and this wheel illustrates all the different kinds, so coercion and threats, intimidation, or intimidation emotional abuse, isolation, um, gaslighting, so that's your minimising, denying and blaming. People can also use children um, in ways against somebody, um, so threatening to um, take your children away from you unless you do what they, they say or you give them all your money or something. Economic abuse is where they take your money um, and devaluing it can be a part of that that minimising, denying, blaming, gaslighting type, type scenario. If you are in a situation where the power and control is out of balance and you're experiencing any of the things in this wheel, please seek help. Um, leaving an abuser is always important, but it can be very dangerous, so please seek help. Now, some of the issues for autistics around this sort of empower balance, these unhealthy relationships are we can believe it when people say they will love us, love us if, when we do something for them. 
we can be quite easily tricked into having sex and not realising we can say no um, and that it's okay for us to use force to remove ourselves from the situation. Or we suddenly realise we're about to have sex of some kind and we haven't seen the signs coming and we don't really know what to do then. We can misread other people, think they're attracted to us when they're not or that they aren't when they are. Um, done both and both are complicated and both are problematic. We can be unaware of sexual health um, and we can be unaware of our sensory reactions to sex. And then there's this thing of, well, that's not sex. So um, Bill Clinton very famously said he wasn't having sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky. Um, well, what was he doing if it wasn't sex? It was sex. Some people would say, oh, let's just have a quickie. And what is a quickie? A quickie tends to mean a very short burst of sexual intimacy. What is safe sex and what is not safe? How do people know what they will or won't find pleasurable? And how do you give or obtain consent for something that might or might not end up sexual? Now, consent and intimacy is quite difficult. And if you have um, a young adult or you are a young adult with some communication issues, you could think about introducing consent scripts. Um, but also you may be an adult autistic in a long-term relationship and you want to try some new things but you're not really sure how to do that in a safe way that offers explicit ways of giving or refusing consent. Um, there are some consent cards. Um, it's a, a card game that you can use to teach consent with, um, and you can get these from um, printerstudio.com forward slash sell forward slash Lucy dash Lynn. Um, and these are beautiful because there are, it's about igniting passions, connecting with someone, igniting passions, and, and who's going to do what connecting to ignite which passion and where. So it, it has a number of cards, and then there is the consent card at the end. So it might say, um, you might use a number of cards that say, um, could you kiss me, please? And they could answer back, not now, in five minutes, um, no. Yes, never. But it also um, enables them, people playing this, to ask for other things to, to lead all the way up to, to sex. Now we need to think about in this context of consent and intimacy that our young people, our children are rewarded for compliance. Now in particular, autistics are often required to be compliant to be seen as successful. Compliance, unfortunately, is often seen as more socially acceptable than autistic questioning. And yet, along comes someone who expects that compliance and gets it. Along comes somebody and um, initiates sex, expecting compliance, gets compliance. Is that abuse? Is it right? Is it not? What if the young person is 10 and compliant? 14, 16, 18, 22, 60. Now, healthy sexual and intimate relationships are based on shared power, even sadomasochism. Um, bondage dominance, not control. And abuse requires compliance. We need to help our young people become non-compliant. We need to help them know that they can, should say no to things they don't want and that no should be respected. I particularly hate no hands down pounds um, or hands out of pounds. This really, really, really annoys me. Um, a part of that is around this thinking that many of us on the spectrum have now is forever. So a rule given is a rule forever. Um, and if you say no hands down pants, well, what does that mean? Does that mean I can't warm my hands up in my pants? Does it mean I can't um, have my hands in my pockets? What it is meaning is please don't masturbate in public. But instead of saying please don't masturbate in public, a generation of young people have been given this kind of social story, um, social script, hands out of pants. When I'm at school, I need to keep my hands out of my pants. No one else has their hands in their pants. My hands are dirty and will have germs on them, even when they're in my pants. My friends and teachers are happy when I keep my hands out of my pants. This isn't telling someone the actual story. The actual story is masturbation is a private activity that takes place in private or with a person or persons that you are intimately involved with. It's never okay to tell someone that they can never explore their own body. 
as autistics, how are we going to learn what sexual behaviours are and where and when it's socially acceptable or safe to engage in these behaviours? When and where should teens learn about how their body responds to touch? It's really important that we're given the opportunity to understand and learn about exploring our own bodies, about masturbation, and that these are private activities and how to do these safely and in socially acceptable ways to keep us safe. And when we have that partial information or understanding, uh, this is when we can get into lots of problems. Um, at what point is texting stalking? Um, if you text somebody and they don't like you, that line is much lower than if they like you. What is a boyfriend, girlfriend meant to do? Um, Information gathered from movies can be seriously problematic. And if I am LGBTQIA+, and also as the person I'm in a relationship with, how do I describe myself in my relationship? Like, if I don't identify as a cis female, how can I be someone's girlfriend? And vocabulary is changing and evolving. But you can choose any language that you're comfortable with. Things like the way that our behaviours are acceptable when we're younger and they're not as we age or as we grow up. So um, this was from a particular person that was really didn't understand when they were sniffing hair when they were six, everyone was fine with it and they thought it was cute. But now if they sniff someone's hair at school or in the street, there are serious repercussions and they get into a lot of trouble. And if you can wear a particular item of clothing, say, for example, I can wear high heels at home, why can't I the rest of the time? And you happen to be somebody who has an appearance that most people associate with being male. Why is that an issue? And it may be an issue around safety in particular contexts and cultures, families, etc. So we really need full information. Mostly I would really like everybody to leave um, this talk understanding the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy relationship, whether it's sexual or non-sexual. Healthy relationships are supportive, positive, and the power is balanced. Even if that person technically has more power, they use it in a way that is balanced. Healthy relationships are also kind, compassionate, safe, accepting and affirming. If you're in one of these relationships, great. If you're not in a relationship, these are the kinds of things that will help you to understand that it's a safe, positive, healthy relationship. Now, unhealthy relationships are unsupportive, critical, and controlling. So where one person is controlling the money, clothes, food, time, etc., who you can spend time with, who you can hang out with, um, what clothes you can wear, what food you can eat, that's all controlling. That's unhealthy. If it, there's unkindness, meanness, if the relationship, if the person is dismissive of you, dispassionate, then it's unsafe. If you're not being valued, if you're being demeaned, it's an unhealthy relationship. And this is a relationship you need to leave. But again, please seek help and assistance to leave. You can get more information from this book. Um, I hate advertising books that I write. You don't need to buy it. You can get it from the library. Um, most libraries do have this. Um, if you do want it, um, go to the Mindful Body Awareness website and it's readily available there. But um, please do just get it from the library. Thank you very much for your time.